For some people, eating a peanut butter sandwich is the difference between life and death. In these individuals, their immune system goes against themselves, causing quite serious, if not life-threatening, outcomes. What am I talking about? Well, today's video is termed anaphylaxis. <laughs> In this video, we're going to go through the pathophysiology of anaphylaxis. We're going to then look at the signs and symptoms, the most common signs and symptoms associated with anaphylaxis. And then we're going to look at a mnemonic. This mnemonic is going to help you retain or memorize the most important things on this video. All right, let's start with the definition. Anaphylaxis, what does it mean? Ana means to go against. Phylaxis means to guard or to protect. So what it essentially means is the immune system goes against the individual, causing quite serious outcomes. So let's go back to the immune system. Why do we have it? The immune system is there to protect us from microorganisms primarily, to protect us from bacteria and viruses and fungus that can cause disease. It also can get rid of damaged and disease cells or cancerous cells. The way that it can do this it can isolate or find certain markers on these cells or organisms that makes them look foreign or different to our own cells. These markers are known as antigens. Think of them almost like a flag that tells them or tells our immune system that thing is not from us, we need to go and destroy it. So with anaphylaxis, they see certain benign or innocuous things as dangerous, like peanuts, like seafood, like bee venom, certain medications, and then the immune system overreacts and causes quite serious outcomes. So let me go through a process here with something fairly common, we'll call it uh, peanuts. So the peanut is the antigen, so let's say here's the peanut, and it's coming in, we've just eaten some peanut butter, this is the mucosa, so this is the lining of your mouth, and what will happen is that antigen, which is kind of seen now as foreign, crosses the epithelial layer of the mucosa and comes in underneath the mucosa. Now, underneath a lot of our epithelial tissue, we have certain immune cells that can do phagocytosis, so it kind of gobbles up foreign things. And these are what we call antigen-presenting cells. Antigen-presenting cells can be macrophages, can, can be dendritic cells, can be B cells. So what will happen here is it will gobble it up and it will chop up the, the antigen and then present it on the outside of its membrane. So that's why it's called an antigen-presenting cell. So this is gonna go for a walk and it's gonna to go to the nearing, nearest lymph nodes. So if this is in the mouth, it's gonna go probably in the neck or under the tongue. And that's gonna present it to a T cell. So in your lymph nodes, you're gonna have a lot of naive um, lymphocytes, which are there to be trained to be matured, so it can hold memory for other encounters with bacteria or viruses and things like this. So in this case, it's gonna be a T cell, but it's gonna be a naive T cell, so I'll just put an N there. So what happens is when this antigen presenting cell presents the antigen, being the peanut, to this T naive cell, it differentiates into, so it changes form into something a bit more mature, called a T helper cell. So now it is more mature, it's more activated, and it's specific against that antigen, which is the peanut. The T helper cell will then send out a signal to the local white blood cells, so it's gonna send out cytokines or interleukins, and what that does is brings in the infantry, in this case, it's gonna be a B cell. So this B cell is also naive. It's gonna come in, or well, many of them are gonna come in, but the, it's gonna select the correct B cell, which has the antibody for that antigen, which is gonna be the peanut. So the T helper cell selects specifically the right B cell that has or can generate the antibodies against that antigen. So it selects the right one, and then the two, so the B cell and the T cell communicate between each other, I won't go through that process because it's quite in depth, but they communicate between each other, which then transforms the B cell into what we call a plasma cell. So now the plasma cell is what we call an antibody generator. So it's gonna spit out lots and lots and lots of antibodies, which look like kind of tennis rackets or upside down Ys. And these are what we call IgE antibodies, IgE immunoglobulin E type. 
And these, sometimes this is called the IgE hypersensitivity reaction, okay? But I'll just leave it at that. So IgE antibodies. So the plasma cell, the B cell, just floods the blood with these antibodies, which are important only against the peanut allergen or antigen, should I say. So these now go into the blood where they then bind onto two types of cells, basophils and mast cells. Basophils are located in the blood. They can move around the body. Mast cells are more residential. So they'll be located in strategic locations in the body, under the skin, in the mucosa, in the nose, in the mouth, in the eyes, respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, because these are the locations where we encounter the outside world and we need protection. So all, all these Ig and IgE antibodies now stick to the outside of the mast cells. Okay, remember these IgE antibodies are against peanuts. Okay, so now what we've done is we've sensitized the person to peanuts. So now, now they are sensitized, now they are primed against peanuts. And this actually goes to the first S. So over here with this mnemonic, this mnemonic's called some dangerous allergens spark disaster. Okay, so the first S here is sensitization. So that's the first S that you need to remember, sensitization, and that is the sensitization of the mast cells, which means the mast cells are now primed, they're gonna go against peanut antigens. So now we need a second exposure. So let's say a few months later, the person eats a peanut butter sandwich, the peanut butter comes in, mast cells are gonna be located just under the mucosa, and what will happen is the peanuts bind to the antibody on the, on the mast cell, and it's gonna cause a response. This response is gonna be kind of in three time points. We're gonna have a fast response, an intermediate response and a slower response. Starting with the fast response. The fast response happens because the mast cell has already got preformed granules in it. So it's almost got packages already inside filled with granules. Okay, so we have granules already in there that are ready to respond to something. So this is gonna be a very fast response. Soon as it binds to the antibody, it releases those granules into the outer area. The first one of these granules is what we call vasoactive, so vasoactive amines. So they're amino acids that are vaso blood vessel active. A good example of this one would be histamine. Histamine. So histamines will cause blood vessels to dilate and become leaky as well as producing mucus in that area. So histamines is gonna be a very fast acting response. Another one is enzymes. So certain enzymes will be released from granules. And remember this response is what we call degranulation because it's degranulating, it's getting rid of all the granules. So that enzymes here can be protolytic, which causes the breakdown of proteins in the tissue. That's gonna cause more inflammation and more swelling and more blood flow and more um, yeah, swelling in the area, as well as activating other enzymes that come from the liver, such as complement proteins and kinin proteins, which can generate a substance called bradykinin that can cause pain, that can cause swelling, that can cause um, vasodilation. So all of these are gonna be very fast acting and we're gonna see the symptoms associated with that shortly. But it's important to note that this is what we call degranulation. So we can actually put the D here, degranulation, degran Ulation. Now, this dictates the fast and immediate response we see with anaphylaxis. So as soon as they eat this peanut and it binds to the, the primed mast cell, we're gonna see that as degranulation and we're gonna have a, see a fast response with symptoms, which I'll go through in a second. The next one is the intermediate response. Intermediate response takes a bit longer because it has to generate these molecules. And they actually generate it from the cell membrane. So they're gonna be lipid-based. So they are gonna be lipid-based molecules. Examples would be prostaglandins, I'll just put PD, and leukotrienes, leukotrienes. So these two molecules, they are gonna cause more vasodilation, more bronchoconstrict, or bronchioles will start to constrict, so smooth muscle constriction, um, more mucus production, vascular permeability increases. So they're gonna cause quite a big effect in the airways, okay? 
Then we have the most slowest response. So that's gonna be intermediate. So that's gonna ha happen not as quick as degranulation, but it will happen relatively quickly. And then we have a slowed response. So this might take hours, if not days. And the reason for why this takes longer is because the cell, once activated through the antigen antibody complex, has to go to the nucleus tell the nucleus to transcribe and translate more proteins. These proteins are going to be cytokines, cytokines and chemokines. So what, what are they produced for, such as interleukin and tumor necrosis factor? Why are they produced? Well, they need to send out signals to the immune system because they want to bring immune cells into their area because they think something they've been invaded by bacterial viruses or pathogens, but really it's just peanuts. But they're going to bring the immune system in and that's going to cause more damage, more inflammation, more swelling, more redness, more heat. And so, but this is going to be a slower response. So this is going to be drawn out. And this is going to be the second D down here and that's going to be delay. So there's going to be a delay associated with anaphylaxis, which is because these chemicals are coming up much later than the degranulation that we saw here. So now what we can do, once we now, now know all the chemicals involved, we can now see what symptoms we expect to see. The most common symptoms associated with anaphylaxis comes within the skin and mucosa. So, you know, 90% of individuals will have symptoms with, that affect the skin and mucosa. The most common is urticaria, which is essentially hives. This is where you, they get red and itchy and swelling, like welts start to go in their skin. So that's fairly common, as well as pruritus. So that is just itchiness that can be due to the histamines, histamine that goes to those nerve receptors and give you the feeling of itchiness, which can be localized in the area of exposure, but all, also the whole body. We're going to also see flushing. So they'll, their face will go red and go hot. And another most important one is angioedema. So this is where things start swelling up tongue, lips, eyes, face, throat. And that's all due to increased vascular permeability. Exudate comes out and starts to swell up areas of the skin and mucosa. Then we go to the respiratory. So a common respiratory symptom. So this is fairly common. So I'll just put C common. This is very common. Respiratory effects, we would see wheezing or strider. So what this is, is the smooth muscles are contracting due to these vasoactive amines and also the prostaglandins and leukotrienes. So the airways are closing in. So we hear wheezing in the bronchioles. It's hard to get the air out. So it makes a wheezing sound. Strider is the upper airway where it's hard to get the air in. So that's due to the closing of the smooth muscle. Um, we're going to get shortness of breath, which is no surprise when your airways are closing in. And we're going to get a cough, which is going to be associated with, again with the histamines, or some of the uh, cytokines, which irritates either the, the cough um, nerves or go into the cough center in the brainstem, which causes the cough response. In terms of cardiovascular, also this is a common signs and symptoms associated with anaphylaxis. We're going, because we're causing so much vasodilation in blood vessels and they become leaky and we're losing volume, we're going to get hypotension. So hypotension, we're going to get a rebound tachycardia, so tachycardia because we're trying to counter the low blood pressure. And then if this doesn't rectify, we can go into shock, which I'll go through in a second. Gastrointestinal, also very common. Nausea and vomiting are very common, whether it's ingested into the gastrointestinal tract or elsewhere in the body, nausea and vomiting is common, as well as, well as cramping cramping because again, we're contracting smooth muscles from these uh, molecules and they're causing the intestines to contract and cramp. So that's also fairly common and diarrhea. Neurological is less common and this can be due to the super low blood pressure. So dizziness, so dizzy, confusion, and loss of, loss of consciousness if it's not rectified, that's gonna be into shock but also the person will feel very anxious or even uh, a feeling of doom. Shock, now this is in the most severe cases. So this is going to lead to very bad outcomes. So the shock 
is due to an extreme drop in blood pressure. The blood pressure is so low because all the blood vessels are dilating, all the fluid is out, and we're not going to perfuse organs. So we're not perfusing organs, we're not perfusing the brain, we're going to have a loss of consciousness, it can even lead to a cardiac arrest, and this is going to obviously lead to a very bad outcome for the individual. So this is where treatment needs to come in. Treatment would be trying to rectify this issue, so the most common is an uh, epinephrine, so EpiPen. EpiPen uses adrenaline or epinephrine and what that does is it causes vasoconstriction. It will increase the heart cardiac output so that, that will help with the cardiovascular effects. It will dilate the bronchioles so that will help with the respiratory effect and it will definitely help with the shock. On top of that we would look at fluids. We try to get fluids in to maintain their maintain their circulatory system. We will look at antihistamines to counter these effects coming from the mast cells, as well as steroids. Steroids would um, go into the transcription level, so the DNA level, and stop the production of certain molecules coming from the mast cell, and also the immune system that is exaggerating this whole response. So these are the signs and symptoms. Just to complete the um, mnemonic, we've got S, so we've got sensitization, we've got degranulation, the A, the A has three things associated with it. We have angioedema. We have airway, because the airway is closing. And we have arterioles, because the arterioles are the ones that are going to be dilating and losing all the fluid. So, and then finally, we have S for shock. And so hopefully this mnemonic now summarizes it all. We have the sensitization, which is the first part we spoke about. We have the degranulation, which is the early phase of anaphylaxis, which can lead to the angioedema, the airways constricting, the bronchoconstriction, the arterioles dilating and becoming leaky. We're lo losing fluid, so that can lead to shock. And it's important to note that this is not always going to happen in an immediate effect. We can also have a delayed effect, which can come hours and days later. And so clinicians need to be aware of that, that anaphylaxis is not always immediate. It can be drawn out and protracted or be in a biphasic manner. So hopefully that video has helped you better understand the condition anaphylaxis. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.